Majesty's Australian ship Canberra is the second of four guided missile frigates built for the Australian Royal Navy. She's had an interesting history. In the early years of World War II, she served on patrol and escort duties in Australian waters and the Indian Ocean. The vessel also assisted in the sinking of German and Norwegian ships and helped the Allies in the attack of Pearl Harbor. Playing a major role in the Naval Task Force, Canberra is fitted with long-range radar, sonar, electronic surveillance sensors and guided missiles. She will open for public inspection on Sunday at number 5 Lee Wharf. Singleton's assault on the tourism market will centre around three so-called tourist trails, highlighting the area's recreational facilities, history and mining industry. The planning has been done by the Singleton Tourism Development Committee, comprising members of the Shire Council and private enterprise. Their idea is that each trail should provide a leisurely day's drive for the tourist with plenty to see and do. We've applied for a grant to develop this as a model if we succeed, I think the neighbouring councils in particular would be interested. The recreation trail will lead sightseers to Lake St Clair about half an hour out of town. The lake is now one third full and breathtakingly beautiful. On two peninsulas formed by rising water, the council plans to build a boat ramp, picnic areas and a children's playground. The council is confident of receiving $20,000 for the project from the Steel Industries Assistance Program. Future council proposals for the site include holiday cabins, a caravan park, a restaurant, heritage centre and a nature reserve. If all the committee's plans are realised, Lake St Clair will be a tourist facility rivalling anything in the state. However, the plans don't stop there. Tomorrow night we'll look at proposals to promote the area's local history. The Regional Director of Education, Alan Beard, yesterday supported the guidelines set down by the State Health and Education Departments, describing them as an adequate means of addressing the problem. So, uh, my word, yes. Uh, in fact, having listened to an expert now and got to understand the basic problems of the transmission of AIDS and, and uh, the handling of it, uh, I think the people who wrote the policy have done a very good job. But if a school child does have AIDS and schoolmates are not informed, aren't they at risk? No, they're not put at risk. That's the wonderful thing really, I suppose. Um, the transmission of AIDS is in fact uh, not as easy as people would imagine. Um, body fluids have to pass from one person to another in such a way that they get into the other person's body. And uh, so it can only happen in very intimate circumstances and certainly it would be very difficult for it to, to happen within the circumstances in a school. Very briefly, will you outline the policy in Hunter Schools? Well, the policy is the same as for the whole state. Uh, it simply uh, uh, indicates that when students have to be um, uh, treated, if they are bleeding or if, there is, uh, if a child has an accident or something like that, and teachers have to handle children where body fluids are concerned, then they should be meticulous with their personal hygiene. They should wear disposable rubber gloves um, and uh, they should wash down areas afterwards with a mild disinfectant. Uh, they should collect any waste material in a plastic bag and seal it and make sure that it's disposed of in that way. It's really just to be meticulously clean is the most important thing. The concerted campaign by rock musicians the world over to help the starving people in Africa began more than two years ago. There were two hit records produced by bands of rock superstars, but the highlight of the campaign was the recent Live Aid concert in England and the United States. Now Newcastle is doing its bit for the cause with a concert this weekend. 
This Sunday, uh, starting at 5pm, we have 10 bands in this level of the Newcastle Workers' Club, which includes two auditoriums um, playing simultaneously uh, for the Appeal for Africa um, thing that follows on from the Goldoff World concert. Alan Dodd is confident the concert will raise over $25,000 for the starving in Africa. And he says there have been records, there have been concerts, there have been telephones. Been Do you think it's been overdone? Well, at first thought, we, um, we thought you get on the bad wagon, and, um, but then the people are still starving in Africa, and so the money's are going to good use. Also today, there were preparations for a music event of a different kind. The Hunter Orchestra gathered for one of its final rehearsals for the second season of concerts this year. The 43-piece orchestra was formed in April and features musicians from the Hunter, Sydney, Brisbane, Adelaide and Tasmania. It's the first attempt to establish a new symphony orchestra in Australia for many years, and the organisers say these concerts will be vital to its survival. The first concert is at the City Hall on Monday night. rounding off an Australian tour which has taken it to all the capital cities and major regional centres. This afternoon, the singers received a warm reception from the 400 strong audience at the Broadmeadow Cultural Centre. They are from Lasky, near Warsaw, where Franciscan nuns run an institution for the blind. The choir was formed after an invitation to Australia from Sydney man Stan Jakomizine. Stan says the singers' lack of sight is no barrier to them and that the organisation behind the trip to Australia has been both rewarding and enjoyable. No, they, they have enjoyed it more than enjoyed it. You know, the, uh, actually, we've been in, in, in a lot of places, and so we've cuddled koalas and we've fed kangaroos, and uh, we even uh, went to uh, the dolphins. <laughs> About 30 parents and their children were on hand for the meeting, organised by SPELT, an organisation assisting children and parents with learning difficulties. Rupert Shedden from the District Council of the PNC encouraged parents to keep up pressure on politicians to increase funding for special education. The State Education Minister, Rod Cavalier, has said that the 1982 Doherty Report, which recommends increases in money and staff to help those with learning difficulties, has been discredited. Mr Cavalier discounts assertions in the report that 18 to 20 percent of the state's population needs special education. Rather than give up, Speld will this week approach every politician in the state with their demands. There will also be protest delegations to Premier Ran and Mr Cavalier who are accused of not doing enough for special education. I know it's very difficult because it's always uh, a money matter but if uh, the future generations are concerned and it's more expensive to neglect these children than to do something about it. It's a sad situation but we've been making re representations spelled in New South Wales for over 16 years now, both federally and state, and we still haven't legislation or adequate uh, facilities for people who have special needs. That's Students at Beresfield Primary School are this week taking part in a variety of communication activities. Today various classes had filmmaking, drama, play reading, skits and storytelling. And once the initial shyness was overcome, the students more than entered into the spirit of the day. Tomorrow the school will hold an athletics carnival. Wednesday, Maths Enrichment Day. Thursday is Arts and Artists Day. And on Friday, leisure activities. Meanwhile, Education Week activities at St Paul's Primary School in Gateshead kicked off with a huff and puff -thon. More than 200 students raced around an energetic obstacle course to raise money for much-needed classroom equipment. The children are used to this sort of exercise, 
The school recently instituted a daily fitness program. The infants also did their part today. They didn't run as far or fast, but they had a lot of fun. Hello, see you later. Ever since the MSB proposed Garrett Street, there have been howls of protests from Carrington residents. The MSB wanted to build a new $8 million workshop on a site it had won from Swamp near Throsby Creek. $1.2 million worth of earthworks later left the suburb with a three-point hectare industrial site it did not want. Housing Minister Frank Walker says after extensive consultation with local resident groups and council, it's been decided that the site is better suited for residential development. We're saving the, the taxpayer a huge amount of money if we can regenerate old city areas instead of having to build new schools and hospitals and roads and put in sewerage. Uh, it's already here and uh, we just simply develop the housing. The Housing Commission is fully committed this financial year so any project on the site is at least 12 months away. On current prices the development would cost around 11 million dollars. Now the MSB plans to use a site in Fitzroy Street for its workshop. The land is sandwiched between the floating dock and a public works installation. The current leaseholder, Burns Filth, is negotiating with the MSB for the release of the land parcel. But the new site is just 1.7 hectares, just half the space which was available in Garrett Street. Brereton says the new site is more than adequate and keeps the workshops in Carrington. There's no doubt that this alternative site is more logical than the original site and is more than adequate to meet the needs for a major workshop construction estimated to cost $8 million. It'll provide the most modern facilities for 190 MSB staff and we believe it's an ideal solution to this uh, long conflict over the siting of the workshops. It's moments before any horse race that many punters wish that horses could talk. The connections of Court Regent behind me here wearing blinkers tell me that if Court Regent could talk, he would tell you that he will be first across the line in less than 10 minutes time. Over in the betting ring however, it seemed most punters were deserting the ageing 8 year old Court Regent for last start Rose Hill winner Wholesale Boom. Wholesale Boom was way into the red, with Court Regent, Koala Bay, Young Charger and String of Pearls rated the only other reasonable chances. The moment of truth. Race 6, the $10,000 HAA Cup underway before a big crowd. And at the turn, it was on for Young and Old. Eight straight number in Arctic season at the tail. They've got 300 to go. And Warmood being tackled by tennis lad Court Regent. And here's the favourite warming up pretty quickly. Wholesale Boom, he's taken over. Down the outside, Koala Bay and right down the outside, Young Charger. But 200 to go. Wholesale Boom, a length and a half in front. Going beautifully too. Now make it two. Moving to second, Koala Bay. Down the outside, Bat on well is young charger but it's an easy win to wholesale boom wholesale, wholesale boom, boom had justified outright favoritism owner bill edgerton showed his delight from the stand koala bay second young charger third port regent much further back it just wasn't to be the gelding's day the winners can smile wholesale boom's jockey alan scorse had done it well right i drew the one alley had a beautiful run up to the home turn on the point of the home turn i went around a couple of runners and uh, never looked backwards did you think before the race began that uh, you could do it so easily? Uh, I thought so, yes. It was, he's a good horse when he's in form and uh, he's found form and he's going to be hard to beat whatever he runs in. Drafted the public and Bill Edgerton gratefully accepted the prize. Wholesale Boom, trained at Gosford by Neil Ward, had again proved to connection and punters that it is fast coming into a class of its own. Officers Andrew Payton and Jane Oakshot are holding interviews in Newcastle tomorrow as well and say they're not surprised that there's been such a response from the public. The purpose of the visit is to provide personal counselling and advice for people who have experienced problems in dealing with government authorities, councils and the police force. Do you find that a lot of the uh, complaints that you're hearing today and will hear tomorrow uh, you're able to resolve quickly? Often, yes, because a lot of the time people don't quite know who to go to and who to see. 
um, the co complaints I've taken today, for instance, I have been able to refer people to the appropriate body that they should have seen, or often they just want to discuss it and decide what the best action to, to be would, would be. They were all out in force today to see what the architect Lindsay Kelly had come up with. The three ministers who were most involved, Mr Newark, whose department will administer and staff the hospital, Mr Brereton, whose public works department is supervising construction, and Mr Woods, who was treasurer, originally provided the more than $100 million required, were all in attendance. The 494-bed hospital will be unique in design, making optimum use of the bushland surroundings and natural light. The Long Line Hospital will follow the crest of the hill and its design steps down the slope. There's no doubt the project is huge. This is just two-thirds of one level of the car parking. And according to its designer, the building will be one kilometre in parameter. It will be a major teaching hospital with obstetrics, paediatrics and trauma services, which will include intensive care. Health Minister Mulock says he's excited about the project, which will be commissioned in 1990. As the architect uh, indicated, with all this work done, we'll be able to commence after June next year on the actual construction of the building. While this new hospital is seen as a godsend, there's still a number of interim health service problems that the minister must address. Community interests. But at his a next engagement in the Chamber of Commerce luncheon, Mr Murlock didn't talk Newcastle about these area. problems. Instead, he outlined in the long-awaited health strategy for the hunter. That certainly will its not prime happen. objective is to centralise and rationalise the hunter's health services. To protect the health Due to the cost of repairing the decaying Royal Newcastle Hospital hosp buildings, it's been decided that it should be downgraded. The research and educational work being done by NewMed One will continue, but orthopaedics, both general medical and surgical services, will be its main speciality. The MARTA will become the region's oncology or cancer treatment centre. Palliative care and medical and surgical services will also be available. There will be more obstetrics beds and an enhanced role for Belmont Hospital. Walls End Hospital will specialise in community health, geriatrics and general medical and surgical services. A study, a study will also be conducted into Maitland Hospital, Hospital to find out if it can be expanded on its existing site. The Mr Mulock also took the opportunity to fire a broadside at the militant Peters medical Katz, specialists. Bruce Shepherd. Also tell doctors Peters Katz, Bruce Shepherd and Michael Aroney what they already know. That is, that the New South Wales Government, through me, has already honoured all terms of that agreement reached between the AMA both state and federal branches, the federal government and the New South Wales government. I have no doubt that these militants will continue rather ineffectually to promote further trouble. I do not believe that they will ever succeed in obtaining mass support because the huge majority of doctors are content with the form of agreement worked out between the AMA and the two governments. School students' sailing events on Lake Macquarie are nothing new. For years, national, state and local contests have been waged on the excellent lake venue. However, on the weekend of August 24th and 25th, it's schools match racing with no holds barred. And it's champion Australian school Sydney Grammar up against the Kiwi champs McLean's College of Wellington. Three boat teams sailing in NS14s from each school will compete in six match races. In each race, it's the crafty aim of each school to get all team boats home before the other schools. The announcement of this unique sailing challenge was made by Belmont 16-foot Sailing Club officials and sponsor Epiglass to the Newcastle media. Bob Snape, convener of combined high schools sailing throughout the state, is largely responsible for setting up the Inter-Dominion Schools Challenge. It's certainly a new concept for uh, sailing students in Australia. I think they're going to be able to match the Kiwis who have, uh, after all, had a number of years of this sort of match racing. Um, that is a problem which will only be solved after the racing next weekend. And uh, I think the Sydney Grammar School, who are representing Australia, have uh, been doing a lot of homework 
and they intend to spend most of next week when they're on holidays uh, getting a bit of match racing experience. So you never know between the, the green and the gold and the black and the white uh, who's going to finish on top. More than 200 parents and students welcomed Mr Cavalier when he arrived to open a multi-purpose building at the school today. Other official guests included Regional Director of Education Alan Beard and Member for Lake Macquarie Merv Hunter. The opening of the Food Service Unit Shelter will provide modern facilities for a new tuck shop for the school's 325 students. An assembly hall which can seat just over 200 guests has also been constructed and will be used for the various school activities. The Minister says that this year has been a special one for educational projects and that the Hunter region has played an important role. I think we fulfil the theme of this year, education, youth and the future. And uh, the Hunter region has been outstanding. You've had edu ecumenical church services, you've had a big opening in Newcastle itself. And whatever part of the Hunter you're in, uh, whether it was Maitland or Newcastle City itself, there have been uh, activities in shopping centres, art displays, songs, choirs, uh, bands. And of course in every school there has been a first class celebration.